Hi class, so when you clicked on this video, I imagine you expected to immediately see me go straight into the uh, example for causal inference. Unfortunately, the experiment with the, the one webcam um, and Murphy's Law pretty clear to me that, well, it was the total bust and I've made the executive decision to at least release this version so that I can release the rest of the module, but I suspect that you would rather I uh, spend my time editing videos. So yeah, it's also, I don't know, 1030 at 10 30 at night right now and i really want to be able to set this video to render before i go to bed so i guess this was a really long roundabout way of saying i apologize that you won't see my weird floating head anywhere beyond this first little psa yeah you'll hear me and see the slides yeah Bye. Sorry. Welcome back. This time, we're going to talk about research designs. So there are a ton of different research designs. These are just a handful of examples. And I'm going to start with smallest type, the case method. So the case method is the close studying of one particular event or person of interest in order to find out as much as possible. So you can think about this study as a case of n equals 1. These can yield really great explanations about particular events, general lessons, or scientific principles. They can bring great inspiration to then do a more detailed project. So as like that example, you could observe that someone in a high power position also has a high level of sensitivity. They may have observed one individual and wanted to see if that one person's tendencies applied everywhere, or if it was just a quirk of them. Now there's some really great advantages to this kind of study. It gives you that ability to describe the whole phenomenon. So you don't have to keep it to a narrow paradigm because you have one detailed data point. You can crawl super deeply into it, examine it from lots of different angles and just really get a handle on it. It also can provide a source for ideas for later projects. And it's sometimes necessary for understanding one individual. We see lots of case studies. You could argue that biographies are case studies. And these kind of case studies can come up in the weirdest places. I've uh, cited MTV shows in some of my papers because they inspired a research question. That is a case study. And it's a way to justify watching reality television for work. <laughs> now, there are some big downsides to the case method. And that's why usually it's a starting point, not an end point. It's hard to know if it generalizes, if it's just a quirk of one person or it's actually a broader phenomenon. And you also don't have a control group. A control group means it's impossible to determine whether like facts or variables are crucial or just coincidence to understanding a person, but it's a good place to start. So next kind of is the bread and butter of most of psychology. I'm a rare exception. I don't really run experiments, but the idea is that experimental method is a research technique that attempts to establish the causal relationship between an independent variable X and a dependent variable Y by randomly assigning participants to experimental groups. The idea is to examine how they differ on their levels of X. Then you measure the average behavior Y that results from each group. So you manipulate whatever the independent variable is, and then you see if there are differences in your outcome. So more on random assignment. So random assignment equates your groups on average. And the underlying idea here is that you're testing these differences between groups with statistical tests. The idea, furthermore, is to determine if those between group differences are bigger than we would expect just by chance, just by some arbitrary assignment of grouping. Because 
you can randomly group people and you can get unusual distributions. It is possible to randomly group all the girls in one section and all the boys in another. It would be unusual and it would be unlikely to occur by chance, but it's possible. So here we have an experiment where we're manipulating levels of power. We are assigning participants to be a leader or we're assigning participants to be leader assistants. And then we ask them to rank a list of items needed to survive on a lifeboat. So the assistant versus the leader, they have kind of a different mindset for how they rank these items. And after they've done that ranking, we measure their interpersonal sensitivity. This is called Ike's paradigm. The idea here is that those in high power are more likely to be interpersonally sensitive. We can see if it's being in a powerful position causes you to be more interpersonally sensitive. And as we can see here, those in higher power scored higher on interpersonal sensitivity. And we can see this with this F statistic and this P value. I know that this is not a statistics class as much as I want it to be. So I'm going to give you a very brief, quick and dirty way to think about p-value because it's going to come up in your other classes. Now the most correct technical definition is the probability of a test statistic being at least this extreme given that our null hypothesis is true. The null hypothesis is that there's no difference between these groups. And we're interested in seeing if the alternative is true, that there is a difference. And a p-value is a way to quantify that. I find this approach a little bit confusing, but this is how it's often taught, so I want to at least cover that and then tell you how to think about it like an actual human. So you can think about it as a way to quantify how unusual these results are, how unusual that would be by chance alone. And in psychology, we have a rule of thumb of p less than 0.05. So this p is a probability and probability of less than 0.05 means we'd only expect to see this situation by chance one in 20 times. So out of 20 experiments, we would expect one to have been by chance.